Greetings. As always, it's a pleasure to have you join us here. I'm Rick Peckman, Ministry Coordinator at the DL um, United Methodist Church. Isn't it a beautiful way to start our services with Nick's collage of nature photos and videos? Gosh, I just like it so much. Um, I enjoy it along with the, the peaceful music we have too, which made me think of something, whoops, sorry about that, which made me think of a sign that I saw in the office. I think Ellen put it up there before she left and it's called Peace. Um, I could show you a quick picture of, I made a copy of it for myself. Um, it was just so cool, it says, peace does not need to be a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. I really like that. Thanks, Ellen. Um, let's begin our service with song. And now our call to worship. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained our praise. And please pray with me. Holy One, you who move so lightly on wind and wave, who can be as mighty as a hurricane, as strong as a tornado, as quiet as a breath, draw near. Give us light, give us spirit. Let us be strong and tender as you are. Let us be fierce in defending the gospel and humble in our understanding of its completeness. Let us become fully your people, Holy One, real, full, and capable. And despite weakness, let us be of great witness. We pray in your name. Amen. Uh, hi there. Story for all ages. 
Wow, this is an awesome book um, by Catherine Ryan Hyde. It, don't, yeah, don't get worried. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just have to share this with you guys this week. It's, it's called, Have You Seen Louise Velez? Sorry, Tracy, it's Spanish. And Anyway, it is so good. Wow, it is a great story. Uh, I'm going to give you tidbits of this story, so you're going to want to buy it, get it from the library. I promise I'll return it. I think it's overdue, like, yesterday so I'll get it back there soon anyway it's a just a powerful story about a young man named Raymond and he feels like he doesn't belong like many of us through our lives have felt like we haven't belonged um, he doesn't belong with his mother's new family not as a weekend guest with his father and his father's new wife he doesn't belong at school where he often feels like an outcast and then after his best friend moves away Raymond has only two real connections. One is with a feral cat that he um, kind of adopts and tames. And the other one is with this woman. Actually, she's a 92-year-old woman that lives in his apartment um, that he just kind of meets through a curious question that she asks him. He's just going down the stairs to, you know, he lives on the fourth floor and she's on the second floor. And she stops him and says, have you seen Louis Velez? Wow, powerful story. Let me share just a little bit. As he's getting to know this woman a little bit better, it's, there's a conversation going on about, so what about you, young one, she asked, knocking Raymond out of his thoughts. Tell me, what is it about your life that is making you so unhappy? I, I didn't say I was unhappy, says Raymond. You did not need to. He struggled inwardly for a moment, fondling with the embarrassment of having been seen. Now, it struck him odd that he'd come to the home of a blind woman. The woman was blind. I don't know if I mentioned that before or not. But he, it struck him odd that he'd come to the home of a blind woman to be seen clearly at long last. And then it continues and this relationship develops. Well, a little bit later on, there's a few more uh, pages I want to share with you out of this book. Um, there's a section where it says, because I noticed that everyone else in the city seems to be the opposite, you know, um, and make them feel bad for maybe not being able to speak English or just being different. But then I decided it wasn't enough because my apologies not for being able to do something that you can just as easily learn to do. No wonder Lewis liked you so much, says Raymond. I just adored him. Oh, and the feeling was mutual, my dear. I adored him. He was like a son to me, except he was, old, he was young enough to be my grandson. But he was more than just family to me. He was, well, I'm not sure what the right words quite are. I know. He was a hero in my life. Yes. That's not too strong. He was my hero. Here, the world is full of all these men trying to model what it means to be a man. But they don't truly know. They think it means being tough, feel nothing, betray nothing. And then Lewis comes along and decides that his definition of a man is someone who is not afraid to be kind. That takes courage, don't you think? It does take courage. Wow. Powerful excerpts from here. Let me share another excerpt from this story. I, you know, you just, you, you guys, by the time I'm done, I know you're going to order it or um, request it from the library. A little bit later, they're, they're having another conversation about family. Do you think I'll ever have a family, Raymond asks his friend. Oh, so that's what trouble is what's troubling you. Yes, of course you will, if you want one. But the last question you should be asking, Raymond, because it's the part that matters the least. Any kind you want. If you want more of an emotional um, intimacy, You'll have a companion who understands the way you are. If you want to raise children, you will. Maybe your own, 
or adopted or fostered ones. Or you'll just be the world's best uncle to your friend's children. The thing about a family is the love. That's what kind of family and how it works. That's just the thing you worry about before you learn that those details really aren't all that matters. Like I told you, you're, you're going to love this book, I promise. And then finally, as the story goes along, there's a shooting. Um, if you haven't figured, this takes place in a big city. Actually, it's New York City. And there's a shooting. And, you know, we've heard so much about shootings and stuff like that. This is where this book really gets powerful. The conversation goes something about like this. Um, how many times do you think I could tap a person on their shoulder and return a dropped wallet to that individual? How many wallets will I hand back before someone shoots me? Uh, I don't know. Yes, you do, Raymond, she says. Yes, you do. Nobody will ever shoot me, says the woman, and you know it. They will shoot my friend Lewis, but they will never, ever shoot me. And the people on the other side, they don't even see it. I see my privilege because I have lived both with and without it. You're going to have to read this story. The jury didn't even see it. They did not even see it. What can you do with the world where people do not see it? They continue to sit there by the water for some time. Have you seen Louis Velez? You're going to love this book. Blessings. Hello. Today is the last of our strange and wonderful Bible passage series. Next week we begin a new series. However, um, this one takes us to 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning with the 16th verse. It is a somewhat well-known story, but people really do struggle with it. It is the story of King Solomon and his judgment with two prostitutes and dead babies. Hear the word of God to you this morning or this afternoon. Sometime later, two prostitutes came and stood before the king, and one of them said, Please, your majesty, listen. This woman and I have been living in the same house. I gave birth while she was there. This woman gave birth three days after I did, and we stayed together, and apart from the two of us, there was no one else in the house. The woman's son died one night when she rolled over him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side and laid her dead son on mine. When I got up in the morning to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the daylight, it turned out it was not my son, not the baby I had just birthed. The other woman said, no, my son is alive. Your son is the dead one. But the first woman objected, no, my son is, is dead. Your son is dead. Mine is alive. In this way, they argued back and forth in front of the king. The king said, this one says, my son is dead. And your son is alive. And the other one says, no, your son is dead and my son is alive. Get me a sword, said the king. Then the king said, cut the living child in two. Give half to this woman and half to that woman. Then the woman whose son was still alive said to the king, please, your majesty, give her the living child. Please do not kill him. For she had great love for her son. But the other woman said, if I can't have him, neither will you cut the child in half. Then the king answered, give the first woman the living newborn. Do not kill him, for she is his mother. All of Israel heard about the judgment that the king made. Their respect for the king grew because they saw that God's wisdom was in him and he could execute justice. Here ends a reading from God's holy word. From time to time, I share a bit of our family story with you. I've done that a couple of times now, and today I wanna to talk with you about the spitfire of that divine family. 
Standing tall, four foot 11, Grandma Sadie would describe herself this way. In fact, she did describe herself this way. I'm four hammer handles wide and a snooze can wide. Now, if you take a look at my height and my width, you can probably see Grandma Sadie pretty clearly. Grandma was the mother of eight children. She was many other things, of course, but she had eight children. And she did not raise them with her husband for very long. This month, her youngest child in Florida, the Uncle Ed that I spoke about in an earlier sermon, has died. He's being buried in Minnesota. A week or so after Uncle Ed died, the wife of her son, Lyle, the wife's name was Bonnie, also died of COVID and other concerns. But you know what I'm sure of? I am sure that the celebration of these three people and the other relatives, including my mother, have been loud and wonderful in heaven. Now, Grandma Sadie, though she was short and squat, really had very fine features. She had a size three foot, for example, and purchased her shoes from a traveling store salesman who went the width and the length of Minnesota. But the problem was she had a size three foot and his smallest sizes were size four. So she would just buy a size three, stuff a bunch of the, the paper that we use in packages to make things celebratory, all of that to keep the size three foot into the size four shoe. Grandma was known in her community as being an innovator, a solver of disputes, a shoulder on which to weep, a gardener that I admire, a good neighbor, but most of all, among the most resilient people I have ever known. She was a very faithful woman, reading her scripture long and hard and worshiping weekly at least. But sometimes the scripture ran afoul of her faith. For example, Grandma had a great deal of difficulty in the story that I just read you. And you can tell I do too, because of all the stumbling I did in it, I think. The tale of two mamas, though, is not about two angry women. It is about wisdom and resilience. Now, perhaps your parents never shared this story with you. My parents told me a version of it. They glossed over the part about it being two prostitutes. They simply called them two women. I think they didn't want to explain to me what a prostitute was. But the story itself showcases Solomon's wisdom. And I did pick up on that. It's one of his first acts as king. Solomon traveled to Gibeon and sought God's blessing for his reign. God had said to him in a dream, ask what I should give you. Solomon remembered the past. He remembered other wise kings and not so wise kings. And he responded, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David. And then he requested with boldness, wisdom. Now, what would you have said? Think hard. Ah, forget about it. Yachts and cars weren't even invented then. But many of us probably would have acted as though we hit the lottery. We may have asked for money and prestige and power or some other form of instant gratification to bring our name into being known. To become as wise as King Solomon, God was pretty pleased. In asking for wisdom, God built on what he already had. His request is what theologians call grace perfecting nature. Try that on your friends sometime and see what they think. Grace perfecting nature. In other words, God simply built on what God had placed within Solomon in the first place. God is no Disney character. God does not have a genie with a golden lamp. God was not taking a foolish man and making him suddenly very wise. God was not taking someone who was a lousy cook and making him suddenly into a cordon bleu chef. Solomon already possessed the makings of being a good king, but God made him better. God granted him an understanding heart over riches, fame, and power. Solomon 
chose wisdom to rule God's people. But have you noticed? We surf the internet, we read news, magazines, and books. We may even speak with understanding about knowledge. But knowledge stays with many of us, and wisdom eludes so many. Without wisdom, knowledge hurdles us down long paths. Solomon, though, was blessed with wisdom. Just in the nick of time, I'll remind you, for soon he would interview two prostitutes who had each given birth just days apart. One, however, had lost her child in the night, and so she stole the other woman's child, which she claimed as her own. It was enough to challenge the wisdom of a king. The tale of two mamas presents Solomon as a shrewd judge whose cleverness makes doing good possible in an unclear case. Both mamas passionately yearned for a healthy, live baby. Both charged the other woman with baby snatching, and both claimed the single remaining child as her own. I think Solomon's solution was pretty shrewd. Since no data existed to prove motherhood, no birth certificate existed, no testimony existed, other than anecdotally offered by two women. So Solomon forced the issue. Bring me a sword, he said. Cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. Solomon's decision may seem harsh, but it quickly brought forth fresh new data in that the real mother was willing to let her child live with the other woman. She was so stirred by the impending threat to her son's life, she conceded the case. Please, my Lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. The other prostitute <clears throat> answered somewhat differently. Neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. Now, which woman do you think is the real mother here? Parents are not usually commended as being good parents when they voluntarily say, let him die. The tale of the two mamas presents Solomon as a pretty shrewd judge of character whose cleverness makes it possible in an unclear case to make a decision. Yes, both mamas passionately yearned for a live, healthy baby. Both had charged the other with baby snatching both claimed the single child as her own, but Solomon's solution brought shrewdness into the matter. He forced the issue. Bring me a sword, divide the child in two. Now, was Solomon's decision harsh in your opinion? Grandma thought so. And I have to admit his decision seems harsh to this granddaughter too, but it quickly brought forth fresh data Solomon had made his decision. You know, today the wise still ask for wisdom. As husbands and wives fight over frozen embryos and divorce settlements, as genetic engineers are able to modify DNA in both animals and human beings, as a nation quarrels over the wisdom or the right or the have to to wear masks. A host of moral issues require wisdom. The creation of a human being, after all, has never been a matter of manipulating genes and cycles. Every stage of creation has both a spiritual and a moral dimension. Have we forgotten these days that God is the creator and we are merely the created? Did Solomon forget? Well, there's something to that statement. In his later years, Solomon's wisdom failed him as he became pretty strong in his own mind. Solomon built shrines and altars to strange deities that would later be torn down by the reformers that had a spiritual center remaining. They chose to follow the Creator who gave us in time the Redeemer. Wisdom has never given anybody a free pass. Wise people can really do some very foolish things. To be truly wise is to remember critical knowledge. The 
The first bullet would be that God created a world which God called good and God gave us the gift of life. The second bullet would be that God has a plan for everything God created and that plan is good. Third, that we are all sinners in need of God's strength and guiding hand and forgiveness. Fourth, that God offers us forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Fifth, that wisdom requires God's help. And though we may not always like the answers, if we seek God's help, God never turns away from a need. He will answer it in the best way that can be answered. Now wisdom falters when we cannot see clearly the past nor the present or pinpoint where the future may lead. We need times of refocusing, of slowing down, and sometimes we have to stop altogether just to get our bearings. We have had some opportunities, haven't we, of slowing down in recent months, haven't we? The risen Christ nurtured a period of refocusing among his closest followers in the 40 days following his resurrection. As a result, the followers were able to move out of Jerusalem as a very small sect into the wider world. It became a major movement we call the church. And that movement, despite its challenges, continues to bless the world in a myriad of ways. Now we are in a waiting time. As we await the arrival for Pastor Chris's leadership to bless this congregation, may we turn often to the Creator and seek wisdom that we might guide both ourselves and others in hope-filled, grace-filled ways. Fall is nearly upon us, a beautiful swash of color during harvest, and though this fall may certainly be different than in falls past, the season will offer us its beauty. It will offer us moments for introspection, time to cultivate wisdom, and to listen to others. I imagine in a little later, probably six weeks from now, I'll have pumpkins on our front stoop, back stoop, and around some of the remaining flowers in the garden. And yet, though it'll be a time of beauty, it will be a time for me to begin to set my sights on where God is guiding. Sometime in late November, we anticipate that Pastor Chris will process help from his role as a chaplain in the Navy in Djibouti, Africa. For him, it has been a long season of being the newly appointed and named pastor without ever having to glimpse your face, without getting to glimpse your face. Pastor Chris, may he, as we have, discover the beauty within this congregation, its dynamic spirit, its can-do attitude, and may he continue to cultivate wisdom among you, just as your previous pastors have, that this congregation will continue to joyfully achieve the plans that the Creator has for us. Amen? Amen. Now, as we come to our prayer time, I suppose I could have brought a knife. I don't have a sword. But in my kitchen drawers are many knives and they're sharp, sharp, sharp. But that's a little frightening. Instead, I chose a sign that has been in our home since we moved here. It was a gift from a former parishioner in Minot. God's got a plan and it's all good. We probably have never ever needed to believe this statement more than what we're going through right now. And if you were going through a lot before the pandemic, life got harder, didn't it? But God's got a plan and it's all good. Let us turn to our prayer of the day. Eternal God, we thank you that we can pause and worship you this day. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the freedom that we have to do this. And we thank you for all of the technology that we have, that we can join together virtually. Forgive our ambivalency when we approach worship only reluctantly, thinking that that YouTube virtual worship will be online forever. 
Help us to come joyfully and willingly to share a cup of coffee virtually with others as we worship together. Forgive our tendency to complain that this, your world, is not a better place, for that is due to human sinfulness. Forgive us our tendency to be complacent and to expect and allow someone else to make improvements when we are unwilling to be un uh, involved and more willing to be a critic. Forgive us our inability to trust in you when the cares of the world rise up before us and cause us to fear and to cower. Be to us a wonderful, powerful, healing presence when our fears and anxieties become overwhelmed. Be the source of our strength when we are weak. Be a solid rock beneath our feet when we wander and when we falter and slip. Be our shield and wrap us in your protective power. Wrap your arms around us, O Lord, when we face danger. Cause the stories and storms of life within ourselves to be calmed. Be with those who walk through life, though life is very lonely. Be with those who have been forced to go to war. Be with those who are in danger daily. Be with the hungry and the destitute and the homeless. Be with those among us and around us who have lost so much. Give to us the grace and the vision to craft a new world where all of your children may eat at a table of plenty and where all are sheltered and where your peace and your love and your justice abound. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. As he taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Please keep the following people in your prayers this week. Pastor Chris, 
Betty, Jan, Steve and Nancy, Bob and Gwen, Michael, Nels, Shelley and family, the family of Amanda, Judy, and Nancy. This week we celebrate with the following people. Happy birthday to Janet, John, Dave, Garrett, John, Shar, Natalie, Oliver, Larry, Jean, and India. And happy anniversary to Michelle and Luke, Deb and Lowell, and Bob and Karen. Just one reminder this week for announcements that the church council meets tomorrow night, Monday the 31st, at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. And as always, you can continue to mail your offering to the church building at 885 Pembina Trail. You can give online through our website, dlumc.org, or you can drop your offering off with Beth in our church office. She is in the office Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. till 2.30 p.m. Thank you. Receive the benediction. Go forth in strength and courage, filled with hope. Go forth knowing that the Spirit goes with us as guide, companion, and trailblazer. May you go forth in the joy and peace of Jesus Christ. Have a good week. Amen.